All right, guys. This episode is a little different from most videos that I have recorded because this video is actually based on a brand new series that's going to be coming over to this channel this year. Now, it's based off of my Pokemon Alola Ultra Creator Feed Nuzlocke, a video that I teased two months ago as a brand new series that I'm in Let's Play that I'm going to do for this channel. It revolves around Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, as well as, of course, the use of Pokemon Bank and Creator P that I will use throughout the duration of the challenge. But, uh, <laughs> I'm going to begin the series on by actually beginning with an episode zero and covering some of the details that I will showcase as I go along the series itself. So to make this easier, I decided that I'm going to present all of this in a PowerPoint and showcase to you some details and such that I'm going to go through in this challenge. So, to start things off, let's begin by actually looking at some normal ground rules that I need to follow as I go along the duration of the challenge. Now, the first rule is that I need to catch the first Pokemon in every single grass patch, cave, and watery area that I go over to. Now, I know normal Nuzlocks follow the rule of catching one Pokemon in each area. I'm going to do it in each cave or watery area, meaning only just one Pokemon each per those areas. And as for the grass patch areas, I can get one Pokemon from all of the grass patches, and then after that, can't get any more. I want to have more variety with what Pokemon I use, because only just having one from each route is pretty limiting, and it would be dumb to do this in a hard game, since Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon are pretty tough games to go through. So that's why I'm making this rule for this special challenge that I'm going to do. I know it kind of breaks that rule a little bit, but if I want to have a little bit of fun and make it kind of a bit more variety in some way, that's the only way I can do it. Rule number two, if I lose a Pokemon in a battle, it's considered dead and can't be used again. Now there is an extra rule that I added into this that makes it a lot more infuriating, but I'll talk about that later. The idea is that if I lose a Pokemon throughout a single battle, it's considered dead. It can't be used again and have to either be boxed or either released but I'm going to box my Pokemon similar to how Manji TV and Jamie Animations have done during their respective challenges. So it's gonna be on the same line as those. Rule number three is that if I lose all my Pokemon throughout a battle, then I lose the challenge. But for my challenge, I'm gonna actually allow my sub to restart at a checkpoint because honestly, I'm kind of stubborn. And while it breaks the mold of a Nuzlocke challenge, I'm not gonna do that for mine. Because honestly, I want to make sure that I get this done since it's a big project. I mean, both the main story and post game? <laughs> yeah, not on my watch, my friend. So that's why I'm allowing myself to restart at a checkpoint at any time. And like I said, I know it kind of breaks the trend of what a normal Nuzlocke usually does, but honestly, I'm kind of stubborn and I don't want to deal with that. Rule number four is that I have to play by battle set style for the duration of the challenge. The goal being that I have to complete both the main story and the post game in both Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. So it's as basic as it is. Battle style set makes it a lot more difficult and I have to complete both the main story and of course the post game as you would expect. So it's pretty much as simple as you can get it to be. Rule five is that I have to nickname all of my Pokemon or see an unemotional attachment to them. This is the rule a lot of people follow in Nuzlocke and I'm gonna do the same for mine. But I'll go into more depth into this later, since I can't nickname any Pokemon that is a shiny or whatever as I go through the challenge. The final normal rule is, is that the dupes, the dupes clause is allowed in the challenge. So if I run into a similar Pokemon within the same grass patch, I'm allowed to run away from it until I get something different to add a bit more variety to the challenge. Now, in addition to these normal rules, I've also added in some brand new rules to the challenge to help make it a lot more easy in some cases, but also a heck of a lot more tricky and difficult in certain cases as well. The first new rule that I've added is that I need to have Creator Key, which is an app that allows me to customize any Pokemon that I want to, Starters and Ultra Beasts as an example. But because of this, I cannot use any Pokemon that is a Gift, Totem, Island Scan, or Pokeheligo Pokemon at all in the challenge. All of those are banned since I need to only use my starter, any Pokemon I catch in the wild, or any Pokemon that I get from Creator Key itself. And on top of that, I need to keep in mind that I also need Pokemon Bank with me as well, since I'm going to be trading over a Caterpie and a Ditto from a different save file into the ones that, that I'm going to use. 
since those are going to be the basis for trading for Caterhees and other such stuff. But I'll go into more detail in that in a second with Rule 4. But that's the agenda with that first new rule that I have in store. Now, as for the second one, rule number two says I can overlevel and underlevel my Pokemon however way that I want to when creating my Pokemon during my challenge. But they have to be matched the corresponding battle and not be too overleveled. What I mean by this is that most viewers would be more entertained if the Pokemon were underleveled. I don't usually do that unless I want to brag, but for the sake of the challenge, I can underlevel my Pokemon if I want. But if I lose a Pokemon, it better be my own darn fault and no one else's. I don't want to blame the viewers for anything because it would be rude and just pretty tacky. So I think my job of actually making them however level that I want to, I think would make things a bit fair for me. So, and of course, they can't be above the level. Say for example, if I go to Hala, they can't be above 35 and so on and so forth. Now, rule three is that I can only get certain Pokemon at certain points in the story as I play. Now, what I mean by this rule is that at the very beginning when I get to the Panola Ranch, which is where I can breed with Pokemon, I will only grant access to only fossil Pokemon, which is pretty limiting. But as I progress in the story, I will gain more and more options as I go along. I'll go into more for further detail into this later when I get into the next chart. You'll see. Now, about that Pokemon Bank thing that I just mentioned earlier, that's where rule number four comes in. In this fourth rule, I know it's going to show up as I talk, but during the Nuzlocke, it does not start until I get Pokeballs, but it also does not begin until I get to the first Pokemon Center. That's because the first Pokemon that I catch is needed for the Pokemon Bank situation in order to trade with certain Pokemon. But this means that the first Pokemon that I catch does not count as an official capture. I have to reiterate this, it does not count as an official capture. So it's the only area that I'm allowing to catch a second Pokemon in because it doesn't make any sense to actually make it as an official capture when you barely got started with the challenge and have to use Pokemon Bank to trade over with certain Pokemon. So please, please keep this in mind. I have to reiterate this. The first catch that I do after the tutorial does not count as an official challenge. After I go over to the Pokemon Center and wrap up the first episode, that's when it counts as an official capture for the rest of the game from there, but not the first one, okay? So please keep this in mind. Rule number five is that if I lose a Pokemon that has a certain type advantage against a certain boss, then I can't use that type's moves against the next major boss until after I defeat him or her with a certain type of ability. Now, what I mean by this is that if I lose, say, for example, Wish Cash during the events of Olivia's Kahuna battle, and of course, the next major boss battle is with Togedomaru, I can't use ground type attacks anymore since the ground weakness is eliminated and I have to beat him using other attacks. Then after I defeat him, I will gain those type advantages back until it happens again later in the story. So that's basically the entire agenda behind this rule. The last and final rule to note is a big one. I'm allowed to save my game at any point during the game, before and after boss battles, and if I just want to mess around and grab some Pokemon. Now, of course, this is also because of the fact that for some boss battles that I'm going to mention as I go into the challenge, I'm not going to necessarily mention every single boss from the main story and the post game. I'm only going to go through some battles that I think are necessary to cover and are, I think, appropriate to go over for the duration of the challenge. So I'm not going to go over the post game battles with Lana, Malo, and of course, um, Kawaii in the uh, Captain Trial fights, for example. I might end up going through the battle tree versions, but not the post game stuff. So. Do keep this in mind since this is important for this challenge to count. Now, again, to reiterate this real quick, I'm doing this challenge with both Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, meaning I will swap between games if there's more than one boss to go over since there are going to be some that will be located in one game, but some that might not be located on another as I go along the duration of the challenge. However, on top of that, as I progress through the story, I will grant access to more and more Pokemon as I progress. Here's a chart I made that shows you what Pokemon I will gain access to after beating the respective Totem Boss and Ultra Necrozma. 
I won't get any after being Totem Gumshoes, but once I get to Panola Ranch, I will grant access to only fossil Pokemon. After beating Totem Araquanid, I will grant access to any Gen 1 or 2 Pokemon, such as Quagsire, Pidgeot, Fero, or Sunflora. After I beat Totem Alolan Marowak, I will grant access to any Gen 3 Pokemon, like Maniana, Minitrick, Gardevoir, and Whiscash that I just mentioned earlier. After being Total Lurantis, I will grant access to any Gen 4 Pokemon like Glade, The Barrel, Star Raptor, and Rapierior, and any of the starters, like for example Primarina if I don't if I didn't choose her, or Venusaur as a particular example. After being Totem Togedomaru, I will grant access to any Gen 5 Pokemon, like I, like for example Drudigan, Haxorus, Gothitelle, and Reuniclus, and any Alolan form, such as for example Alolan Marowak, Alolan Ninetales, or Alolan Sandslash as a couple of examples. After I beat Totem Mimikyu, I will grant access to any pseudo-legendary or legendary Pokemon. So pseudo-legends like Tyranitar and Dragonite, or any legendaries like Dialga, and of course, Zekrom. After I beat Totem Kamo, -O, I will grant access to any Generation 6 Pokemon. So Gen 6 Pokemon like Trevenant, Gorgeist, Clawitzer, and Dragalge. After I beat Ultra Necrozma, I will grant access to any Generation 7 Pokemon, such as, for example, Zarina, Bruxish, Beware, and, of course, Crabominable. Lastly, after I beat Totem Rabombi, I will grant access to the Ultra Beasts, such as Buzzwool, Nihiligo, and, of course, Faramosa as a couple of examples. The next thing to talk about is in regards to extra notes. Now, one of them I did not post yet, but... The main thing is I'm going to reference a lot of these Pokemon as a he or a she to make things a little easier to, you know, basically manage who I'm talking about and everything, except if it's with actual boss battles and such. I don't think it's fair to call the Pokemon as an it because it sounds a little cringe to me, so I'm not going to do that for the duration of the challenge. But the first extra note is in regards to nicknames. Now, I'm going to try and be as creative as possible with most of my nicknames, but they won't be as particularly efficient as how other YouTubers would do it during their Nuzlocke challenges. I'm gonna mostly based off of mine over certain YouTubers that I've watched, or game characters, or movie characters, or even stuff from TV shows or anime that I think are important to mention about. And if I'm, if I'm allowed to, I'll go into detail with them as I go along with the challenge. The second thing to note, the second thing to note is highlight reels. Now, I'm going to condense everything after I finish the challenge, into the best highlight reels that have happened throughout the challenge. Basically going into detail about what I think when I went over to the respective battles and so on and so forth. I'll try to condense everything the best I can, but since it will be my first time making a review video, it might not be perfect, so keep that in mind. Now, the next thing to note, bosses having splash screens. Now for every boss that I have fought against, I've actually made a few splash screens for every single boss that I will battle against in the game. Now, the template that I will use is actually a Kirby Star Alley splash art template that was created by Saturn Domo on DeviantArt. I'm giving him credit for this template because I found it pretty fascinating that you can create your own little boss templates essentially with this little template of hers. And I'm going to also create some very special ones for certain bosses if it's an exclusive boss coming from Ultra Sun or Ultra Moon, a post-game boss, or if it's a Pokemon boss that I think deserves to have its, his or her own unique splash screen. So I'll try to be as creative as I can in that regard and make it as unique as possible in that regard as well. And then as for the last extra note that I'm going to mention, it's in regards to boss lists. I created 12 different boss lists for this particular challenge. Each boss list containing a different amount of bosses depending on where I am in the game and determining who I have to battle against when going over those respective boss lists in general. The idea behind these boss lists is that they pretty much function very much the same as the boss rushes from the Martin Luigi series that I've done, but they behave a bit differently. Since I created 12 boss lists total, I will show you the 8 that I will already grant access to at the very beginning of the game. As you can see, these 8 boss lists already contain the total amount of bosses I have to face against in each of them, so I already have an idea of who I'm going to battle against when I get over to these eight specific boss lists in general. However, I've also created four extra ones, but these last four have question marks on them because they resign into the post game. 
Once I beat the main story, I will then grant access to these post-game lists, and you will see eventually who I will battle against when I get over to those boss lists in General 2. So I'm keeping these as a secret, so that's the entire idea behind the whole boss list in General 2. So it's going to be a pretty big series, so that's the entire idea behind this last thing that I got to note and, of course, mention about before I get started with the series later on. But other than that, guys, that's pretty much all the small details I have to talk about for this series. So I do hope that you guys enjoy my first ever episode for the series, even though this is technically episode zero, like Forgotten Land and War War Gold. But I hope you guys enjoy the little presentation that I have with presenting with how the challenge is going to work. I'm going to see you guys when I get over to the challenge later this year. And depending on if it's in late March or if it's in the beginning of April, I will begin the challenge and try to win it. So I will see you next time when I get to the challenge. So till next time, guys. Bye.